healing is possible. We share stories of people everywhere who have healed from their diagnoses. Powered by HealthRevolution.org I'm your host, Dr. Anup Kumar. Welcome to the Healing is Possible podcast. My guest today is Dr. Ken Milne. Dr. Milne has been working clinically as an emergency physician for 27 years and is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Department of Family Medicine. He teaches evidence-based medicine, clinical epidemiology, critical appraisal, and biostatistics at Western University in London, Ontario. Dr. Milne is passionate about skepticism and critical thinking. He's the creator of the Knowledge Translation Project, The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, the SGEM. Dr. Milne serves as a senior editor of Academic Emergency Medicine, and he also states that he has no funding from the pharmaceutical or biomedical device industry. Ken, thanks for being here. Just to set some context, um, we're both emergency physicians here in Canada. I'm in the United States. Um, and I think we had spoken after I aired the prior episode with Professor Lehman McHenry, who had written that book called The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine, which brought up a lot of questions about what EBM is. And you're obviously a, a well-qualified person to speak about this. So I wanted to get some con context from you for the audience. So thanks for being here. And just you know, any introductory remarks that you might have based on the conversation you heard between uh, Lehman and myself love to hear. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I always love talking nerdy. And if I can talk about evidence-based medicine, I welcome the opportunity. And I really enjoyed the podcast that you did with your other guest. Um, and I ordered the book. I haven't received it yet, but yeah. based on your podcast, I already ordered the book. It looks fantastic. Yeah. Um, but like most things, there's a little bit of nuance, a little bit of things that I wanted to add if I could. So I, I yeah. reached out to you and said, are we possibly setting up a straw man here? Yeah. Um, is this something that's being set up as easily to be knocked down? And could we have a conversation about what I think evidence-based medicine really is um, based on the original definition? I'd love it. So please share with us the original definition and what EBM really is. Well, first of all, EBM to me, rocks. I mean, I can't think of what other method of practicing medicine do you want to use? And so let's get to that original definition as put forward by David Sackett, Heinz and others. And it, it actually goes back to an article that was written in 1996. I don't know about you, but boy, that just seems like yesterday to me. But I was actually, I had graduated by then. I was already <laughs> doing medicine. And it's like, oh my God, how did that happen? How did, you know, like, what is that? Almost 30 years ago, mm -hmm. crazy. Um, but, you know, David Sackett published this um, piece saying, you know, evidence-based medicine, what it is and what it isn't. So this has been going on for, you know, 20, 30 years. And it's about integrating individual clinical expertise and the best external evidence. And so when they put this idea forward, they recognize that evidence-based medicine, like most things, it's not a new concept. This philosophy actually has been around since the mid 19th century back in Paris. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look at it, it probably goes back further. Like most things, there's layers to it, right? And so I look at this sort of late 20th century as a bit of a renaissance or an enlightenment, if you will, if we can continue with that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, and Sackett said, you know, evidence-based medicine, it's not just about the literature. It's about the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best evidence, and this is important, in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And so what he meant by that is that there's really three pillars to evidence-based medicine. And I guess because it starts with evidence, that's artificially put as the most important, and it's not. In their original definition, the evidence is important. It should guide our care. It should inform our care, but it was never intended to dictate our care. And in fact, in that original article, he warned about saying, we don't want this to be hijacked and be considered cookbook medicine. Oh, look, you just take these ingredients and you provide the service. 
he emphasized that it was super important to use good clinical judgment. We're clinicians and we treat people. We help people. We hopefully heal some people one at a time. And that's the real challenge, of course, of, of evidence-based medicine is that we take this evidence that is population-based, it's a study, it's a cohort, it's a randomized control trial, whatever it is, yet you have one patient in front of you and their journey and their experience may not fit within the inclusion and exclusion criteria of whatever study was being done. And so you got to apply your clinical judgment, but that person is a unique individual. And their values and preferences need to be respected and their autonomy and agency needs to be considered when making any clinical judgment. So the best doctors, I think, will use their clinical expertise, look for the best evidence. Sometimes the best evidence is crap. It is. Well, a lot of times it's not very good. But then engage with the patient. Say, hey, what do you think? You're an expert at yourself. You're yeah. an expert at you. Yeah. I'm just an expert at the book and the science and that kind of stuff. Let's yeah. put our expertise together and find a good pathway forward. Yeah. So that's what evidence-based medicine is to me. It's, it's, it's the best evidence combined with your clinical judgment and, of course, engaging with patients and asking about their preferences and their values. I love that. And it, it really gives importance to each of those three words, evidence-based. And based to me is kind of like, the judicious aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, you got to use your judgment. Right? Yeah, yeah. Does and this then, apply? And then, and then, really, medicine because evidence based is really a qualifier of medicine. So, really, what we're doing is practicing medicine, and evidence based medicine is it's actually a practice. So now that takes us back to this word evidence. And can you speak to us about the difference? I think before the term evidence-based medicine came around, there were still levels of evidence, right? We were still talking about levels of evidence and then it, levels of ed evidence kind of starts to inform the practice of evidence-based medicine. So can you speak to us a little bit about levels of evidence and how that might've changed over time? Because in our conversation previously, you had pointed out how um, randomized controlled trials uh, are not the top, um, maybe meta-analyses and maybe systematic reviews are at the top, but are they? Speak to us about the levels. So the answer is it all depends, right, on what you mean. And I'll just take one step back before, and I will answer that question, of course, mm -hmm. but I'll just take one step back. I would encourage people, if they're interested in evidence-based medicine, to read that original 1996 um, publication because Sackett actually warned us and said, this is not cookbook medicine, but also warned us that he was concerned that EBM would be hijacked. And there have been publications since by John Ioannidis that specifically said evidence-based medicine has been hijacked, 2016. You know, there was another um, publication about how evidence-based medicine is failing due to bias trials and selective publication. And so um, go back, I always encourage people to go back to the primary literature. And so hijacked, yes, I think it has. And here's how I think it has been hijacked to some degree. There's been this artificial pyramid of evidence that came out in the 90s. And maybe people have seen it, this nice colorful pyramid. Mm -hmm. It's got these crisp lines and these demarcations. And it says, you know what? Expert opinion is of the lowest level. So whenever I'm talking and teaching about evidence-based medicine, I tell clinicians that everybody is practicing evidence-based medicine. Everybody is. Because expert opinion is evidence, right? And it's hypothesis generating, and it can be correct or it can be incorrect. And sometimes we don't have anything better than expert opinion in my experience, my clinical practice, but we want to search for the best evidence. So they put in this pyramid, okay, we did an observational study. It's not controlled. It's not randomized. There's these biases built in that can't be controlled for. But only mid-level is randomized control trials. And so when I was listening to your podcast, I was like, well, RCTs aren't on the top. And I don't necessarily agree with this pyramid anyways. But RCTs aren't even on the top. Above that is critical appraisals of a single topic. And then you get up to the systematic review. And sometimes you can do a meta-analysis, which means putting the data in a meat grinder and grinding it up and thinking you've come up with the truth. Um, but a meat grinder nonetheless. And there's problems with that sort of hierarchy and it's somewhat artificial. And so 2016, they came out with an update 
for this pyramid. Because you know, the absolute highest level of evidence, this isn't on the pyramid, but I teach this, is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial, lots of words, with an N of one. I care about it if it works for you, not if it works for 17% of the population or something right. like that. I want the N of one. And so that's the high, but you know, it's obviously impractical to do a randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled crossover trial with every single patient you see. Yeah. So we have to extrapolate. Yeah. But they did update it. Yeah. And they updated it for two important reasons or two rationales. First of all, this thing called the grade criteria comes out. Because just because something's a randomized control trial doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's better than an observational trial. I will take a really well done observational trial over a very, very flawed randomized control trial. So just because you put randomized doesn't make it magically better. Same thing applies to a systematic review. So if a systematic review is done, if it's full of really high quality studies that have been graded high quality, okay. But if you take a bunch of crappy little studies, CLSs, crappy little studies, and they're observational studies, and th this isn't my term, it actually goes back to another doctor who says, if you take a whole bunch of like really high quality studies and you add some crappy studies, it's like adding a cow pie, which is poop, by the way, if you live in the country, to an apple pie. And adding that lower quality of evidence mm, doesn't make the apple pie taste any better. Yeah. And so that's the concept of GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. So yeah. it just means something's published. It's a randomized control trial. It doesn't mean it's the truth. It means we need to critically appraise it. And so this new pyramid, what it does is instead of these nice crisp lines between, oh, an observational study, case control study, randomized control trial system, it has these wavy lines these blurry lines, because it is blurry, it's nuanced, it's, it all depends. And then they put a magnifying glass, that's the second thing, over the trials and said, if a systematic review is done, you still have to assess the quality of the ingredients. In other words, the biases that may have potentially influenced the original studies. And then you, with a systematic review, you can't control for some of those biases, and so you can just magnify them. So you've got this artificial pyramid to summarize. It's artificial. You still have to look at the individual claim and the individual evidence and says, does it apply to that N of one that I'm treating? And they've updated it to try to emphasize that it is nuanced. I love that. I love going back to what you said about, um, you know, expert opinion is evidence. Um, and if I can tie that together with something else you said, which is that each person is an expert in their own experience, you know, and uh, we talked about this on the phone call that the majority to put evidence in, in context, the majority of what everybody does it is based on evidence, but it's not, it's not a, a, it's not a study that was done. And the evidence, the example I gave you was when I walk. I trust that my next step is not going to go through the floor and go to the center of the earth and out the bottom, right? Because I have evidence because I've stepped millions of times and therefore you have, you I have, have evidence. so much evidence. Absolutely. That <laughs> gravity that's, exists. Yeah. That's my, that's my N of one. I, I see it around me. It seems to exist for everybody else too. So it works, but uh, I say kind of facetiously, but if you actually look at the, the building blocks of a day, of, of, of eating your food and going somewhere and coming back and, and using the bathroom and, and talking to somebody. And, and maybe if you're in ER position, you know, seeing somebody in a life-threatening situation, making decisions, 99.9% .9 of what we do is based on evidence, but it's anecdotal evidence, which traditionally would be considered as, as low quality and not RCTs, not putting down the importance of RCTs and systematic trials and, and systematic reviews and critical appraisals. But I think it just, to me, that opens up a field of appreciation for what evidence really means. Yeah, I think people, when they, when they um, say, well, that's just an anecdote, uh, I think that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, or it's, it's a bit, um, I find it, you know, I used to say it too. I find it a bit condescending because um, it is an anecdote. And so I go, oh, well, that's interesting. That's hypothesis generating. Let's look into that. Maybe there's more behind that than, but you don't just discount it out of hand, right? And my feedback to you was, 
I don't need a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized control trial to look both ways before I cross the street. Right. I, I've learned without having a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial to look both ways before I cross the street. Mm -hmm. And so far, survival bias shows that I'm still around. Right. 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 Um, and and the humility that goes with that. Um, I shared with you in emergency medicine, we're in the world of emergency medicine, but this is not exclusive to the emergency medicine world. Yeah. This is, a, um, I think, translates to most of medicine. You said 99.9 .9 of our daily life percentage. Uh, you know, that's pulling a number out of your tuchus. Yeah. Um, I don't know how close that is to the real uh, point estimate, yeah. but we have an actual number, whether or not it's a true number, for <laughs> what we do in emergency medicine. And I shared that with you. Yeah. And and you, I had you guess and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah. there was a umbrella review. So that's above a systematic review on this pyramid that, you know, yeah. we talk about. Yeah. So the umbrella view, review takes all the random or all the systematic reviews in emergency medicine and says, how much of it is actually high quality evidence, high level evidence, or is most of what we do based on low quality evidence? And the actual number was 2.8%. And I think we can get lost in that precision, yeah. but I would feel comfortable saying, you know, in the single digits, yeah. of what I do every day in the emergency department, yeah. I'm doing with the backup of saying, yeah, I got really high quality evidence. I got really high level of evidence that says I really should be pushing for this. Most of the time, 97% of the time, yeah. there's a lot of room for shared decision-making and yeah. what do you think? And we're not so sure. And I'm comfortable with uncertainty here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's not just about values. It's just, based upon like a decision. We're not strictly talking about uh, values there too. So yeah, I think I'm going to stick with my 99.9 .9 since <laughs> since we're at 97.2. It, it works. That's, uh, yes. I'm going to go with 99.9 .9 for the rest of life. I'll add a few nines, 99.9999. Um, but yes, I, I'm i saying that because for myself, um, I went through that process. I remember when I said, uh, when I felt that too, I said, well, oh, if that's just an anecdote. I was, I was like, I can't, if I can't value that, that feels wrong. Like I need to be able to value stories. I need to be able to value narratives, as you said, as hypothesis generating, as a place to, that N of one may lead to an N of a thousand, right? But if I don't value the N of one, there is no thousand. Um, You'll never look into it. You'll yeah. never investigate it. You'll yeah. never consider it. And that N of one might be right or it might be wrong. I want to know as many right things and as few wrong things as possible, but yeah. that's a starting point. It's not an ending point. And that's what I was getting at when people just dismiss anecdotes. I agree. There's tons of biases involved with anecdotes, recall bias and, and other types of biases. And we are all flawed individuals. I'm a flawed individual walking through this world we call life. And I bring all those flaws with me and those cognitive biases with me. So I try to try to eliminate as many as possible when I'm evaluating the evidence. But I don't want to, I don't, I'm, I'm cautious about not leaving saying we can't get better evidence than anecdotes. Yeah. We can do better and we should yeah. do better. And it doesn't mean we need to do more research. It needs, it means we need to do better research, asking the right questions, the questions that are important to patients. Yeah. You know, I don't care if their blood pressure changes by two points. I compare, uh, you know, I'm worried about if the patient is alive or dead, if they have good neurologic function, if they can do their activities of daily living, all these types of really clinically important patient-oriented outcomes and not these surrogate markers. Um, you know that there was that great um, tongue-in-cheek BMJ article, 2003 by Smith et al., about parachutes and about parachutes used to prevent major trauma related to gravitational challenges. This was a foundational publication in the Christmas edition of the BMJ or the holiday edition of the BMJ. And they were looking for any randomized control trials, looking at parachutes to prevent major gravitational injuries like morbidity and mortality. And they did a, a thorough search and couldn't find anything out there, yeah. you know? And so they suggested taking people like me, people who advocate for evidence-based medicine, oh, you need a randomized control trial, said, tell you what, you guys do a randomized control trial as the participants. We'll fly you up in a plane. You'll either get randomized and it'll be blinded. So you'll get randomized to either a parachute and the sham. So it wasn't just a placebo. It, the sham was a backpack. 
and then you would jump out. And anybody who survived to make it a more rigorous study, it would be a crossover trial. And so you would cross over to the other arm of the study, go back up in the plane and jump. They've been recruiting for over 20 years and have still not got anybody signed up for this randomized control trial. Because yeah. again, we don't need an RCT to say jumping out of a plane without a parachute is probably not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Point taken, Ken. Point but take. you know what they but they did do a randomized control trial on this. <gasps> Twenty eighteen. Did didn't we do something similar in emergency medicine where it used to be uh, epi and atropine that we would give all the time, and and now like atropine has been has been phased out, you know, in in cardiac arrest. I'm speaking of. Yes, we've been slowly taking the little vials out of the toolbox yeah. um, for cardiac arrest and. Yeah. Um, it still contains epinephrine despite the paramedic two trial showing no significant difference in good neurologic function um, in outcomes. And yet we're still using epi, but yeah. they did do a randomized control trial on parachutes. And this gets into the, the you know, how you have the pyramid, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we say, well, we don't have good evidence. We just have stories of people jumping out of airplanes and surviving. We have stories of people, anecdotes of people surviving. Um, falling from ridiculous feet in the air. But we also have iat iatrogenic injuries of people, you know, the parachute was there and they got hurt, they got harmed, they got an adverse event because they were wearing a parachute. So they actually conducted a randomized control trial on this in 2018 and published it in the BMJ. And this is where the microscope or, or the magnifying glass gets out. And they they got so many participants either to wear a backpack or a parachute and jump out of a plane. And they found no difference. And you're thinking, what? And this is where the magnifying glass came out. The average velocity of the plane was zero miles an hour. And the average height, I think it was two and a half feet because the, the plane was on the ground. So these things matter. Yeah. And so you got to, oh, well, it was a randomized control trial. It must right. be true. Right. Well, you got to right. look at the details. Right. You know, this uh, part of why I wanted to have you on is because this is such an important topic because some of the people I interview um, have had certain diseases that they healed from in unconventional ways by mm -hmm. going around, um, by not doing the traditional route, right? So they use their own, their own ways of doing it, usually a combination of nutrition, movement, connection, and rest in some form, what we call the four engines of health and healing. Um, and these are many ends of one some have been studied to some extent certainly not as well studied as as uh you know let's say antibiotics and chemotherapeutic agents that we traditionally use in healthcare but i think the nuance is so important because an n of one absolutely works for that n for that one person um and to extrapolate that to another person requires a bridge of study and understanding, which is part of what we're trying to do here. I'm not conducting randomized control trials and systematic reviews, but trying to look at stories and find common themes that might serve as the basis for hypothesis generation and investigation so that we can safely extrapolate, right? So that's the key is that one person took a risk, did something, they had a great result. There will be others who did not have good results. Um, just like there have been people uh, who who used parachutes that semi worked that kind of broke but still lived maybe they had some adverse effect it worked at least they stayed alive but would we extrapolate that certainly not because we don't have that knowledge base but what kind of hypothesis can we generate about how the parachute worked how it didn't work what was different about it i think that's such an important thing to do especially in health and healing when the field is so broad and open. There's, there's so much more we don't know about the human body and the human being and the processes of physiology than we do. So that that's kind of another frame for why I brought this conversation to light. Well, I, I completely agree with you. I've been doing research for 40 years. Why? Because there's still so many unanswered questions. I love asking questions. Yeah. And so it's trying to figure out the right questions to ask and the right methodology to answer those questions. And there was a paper published in 2018, because I don't come with anything to back my comments up. You know, I like to bring, you know, some evidence besides just Ken said. Um, there was a paper back in 2018 uh, by Hayes in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. 
saying that most medical practices aren't parachutes. So we can ask those questions. And so, like you said, you had someone who, you know, I don't, I don't like to dichotomize into traditional, non-traditional. Um, I've often said, you know, Eastern versus Western. I don't practice medicine by a compass. Um, I just look at the claim and what's the evidence for the claim. And if it works and it's good evidence, I'll use it. And if it's not good evidence or it doesn't have logical arguments to support the evidence and stuff, I'm not going to use it. And I don't care what the source is at that point. I'm evaluating the claim. And if you come to me and say, well, I've had a person that has had this outcome and it was a good outcome and they followed this treatment uh, regimen and whether that was nutritional, exercise, whatever you're talking about, that N of one, you have what they did and the outcome. And I want to be careful about, you know, I'm being critical about the snootiness of randomized control trials, systematic reviews, the ivory tower. I'm not in that snooty category, at least I don't think I am. But at the same thing, we, we also have to look at that N of one and say, interesting, hypothesis generating. I don't invalidate your experience, wouldn't do that, but I might question your interpretation of the cause. So all you can do with the N of one is said, I did this, this happened, that's an association to have higher levels of evidence to say, well, I'm going to take that and apply it to a second individual, which is what you were talking about. You said, well, how do I take that and extrapolate it to the next patient or the next person? What you do is you take their regimen and what they did, and then you can do a trial or you could do a study to start with that's an observational study go to a randomized control trial because most things are not parachutes and we should be looking for the best evidence. We shouldn't ignore evidence, whether it comes as an anecdote or if we have really good randomized control trials that say something is not showing a benefit and I hate to bring up COVID late in the conversation, but there are some treatments that were suggested that have been subject to high quality randomized control trials. That didn't work. I'm not emotionally invested in that. It didn't work. I'm emotionally invested in giving the best care to patients so they can have the best outcome. So we shouldn't ignore anecdotes. We should investigate hypothesis, all that stuff. But we also shouldn't um, ignore or invalidate a randomized control trial as well. But I know that you had some concerns about this whole idea of how do we end up with published literature in the first place? Yeah, I mean, the, the question I had, maybe we can pick up on this point that um, it was a central point in Professor McHenry's book that he co-authored. Um, I, I just had a quick thought I have to say, but so many questions and topics that we could cover yeah. about evidence-based medicine in, like, as it relates to- We can do a part two. We can do a part two. Medicine, and, you know, like, stents and heart disease, you know, TPA for stroke, um, you know, psychiatric drugs. There's so many. I mean, if it's 97.2 in emergency medicine, I mean, like, you know, that, yeah, that's endless conversations. I can see why you have a podcast just dedic dedicated to this. Um, but to pick up on one of the key points in Professor McHenry's book, um, it was really what, what I kind of, I call it the denominator problem. Um, now, we know about reporting bias um, in trials. We know that um, there are many trials that are not reported. If they don't go well, you know, we don't publish the results. Um, but it was really striking to me how, he talked about data ownership and how for industry funded trials, the data belongs to industry. It's an interesting conversation because now data is a big topic, even just, you know, in, in tech, you know, if, if you're on social media or we're using the internet uh, and the data that's collected of us, who does that belong to? Does it belong to us? Does it belong to the company collected? Is it shared? Those are big questions we're asking now. And similarly in healthcare, you know, when, when a trial is done, um, who and with people, the data that describe these people, let's say, uh, who does that belong to? Right now in industry-funded trials, it belongs strictly to industry. And therefore, what's happening is that it's not just the trials may not be reported, but the data themselves are selectively published so that, you know, I can show if there, if there are 100 pieces of data, I can show the numerator of 10 and say, look, out of this 10, that numerator becomes a denominator. Out of this 10, seven out of 10 really worked amazing. And only three out of 10 didn't, right? That numerator of 10 becomes a denominator of 10. Versus if the trial could have actually had 100 pieces of data 
and now you're talking seven out of 100 rather than seven out of 10. So this seems to be something that happens quite frequently. Um, and the problem with this above reporting bias, I mean, we know that journals will selectively publish um, studies that show positive results. They're more exciting to see. We want to see, yeah, we did something cool. And certainly it's valuable if, it, if it's valid. Um, but what do we do with this kind of problem where the, the editors don't know? Right, because if what they're receiving is a numerator that's posing as a denominator, what do you think about that? Is it even relevant? And what can we do about it? Well, I'll start with a dad joke that also crosses over into stats because I'm just basically a dad nerd, uh, and that's that cool. is there's a fine line between the numerator and the denominator. Um, <laughs> but the numerator is where your agenda is. And the devil is in the denominator. What is that denominator? Yeah. And sometimes that's not known. And that's why that's the devil. Yeah. Okay. Not to get religious on people. But um, I think that it involves a system from people uh, um, volunteering or being paid, you know, as participants in a research study, all the way through to the communication of a published research, the dissemination and the knowledge translation. And that whole process, I think, needs to be rethought of. You have competing interests, of course, when you have a for-profit company. I have no problem with for-profit companies, um, but they have a primary duty and it's not to the science and to the patient. The patient, I think, um, if they're volunteering or participating or being paid for uh, participating in a study, I think they have a case to be made that their their data that's generated from them as a human being um, should be shared with society in an open way. And so having studies registered is a starting point, but that hasn't solved many of the problems. Lots of studies get registered and never published, or they register them and then they change their primary and secondary outcomes around. Mm -hmm. There's data on that. But once it's registered, I think that whatever data is generated should be open source, de-identified, so you don't know the individual patient, but that data should be available for anybody else to go and explore from their aspect and not from the pharmaceutical or whatever industry is looking at it. If it was all government sponsored, if they can come up with a way to do that, but people have concerns about government, anytime people are involved, there are biases. But if we could minimize them, that would be great. And I pitched an idea to you when we were talking on the phone saying to get around this publication bias, this, oh, um, a positive study gets published. Oh, it didn't work out. So, oh, look, I've got a drawer over here. I'm going to put it in the bottom of my drawer because that's not going to advance my career in the university. Um they should submit their research protocols, their methodology to the journal, whatever high impact journal, whatever journal you want, and say, we're asking this question that we think is important. We're going to use these methods to try to answer this question. Are, is this question important to patients? Yes or no. And is this uh, method going to get the question, the answer we're asking? And then the journal says, through its editors and its peer review and its statistician saying, yeah, they're asking a good question from our field. This, this would be a good question to answer. Our readers would like to know this question and their methods are solid. We'll publish it. Let us know once you have the results. Hmm. Boom. Because I think it's equally as important, at least, to publish a study that we asked an important question, we had good methods, and we found out it didn't pan out. That's important information for me to know when I'm treating patients. I know that, nope, this one isn't necessarily a good option for you. And so publishing negative results. And I think if we blinded editors and blinded peer reviewers and blinded journals, a priori, because they don't have the data collected yet, what the results are and say, is this worthy of your journal? Yes or no? And they say, yes, they publish it, no matter what the results are. Yeah. And I would add to that, that if we could... If we could have some uh, pass a law, a mandate, something that says that whatever data you collect has to be shown. Oh, open access. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen stories of, uh, you know, researchers fighting for a long time 
to wrestle the data from the original yeah. owner of the data, which is usually a pharmaceutical company. And I'm thinking of some of the antiviral agents that we'd used in the past. And, um, and then once they get access to the data, guess what? It's usually yeah. not as rosy yeah. as, and, you know, because, but they have a bias to present the most rosy picture yeah. of the data. I get it, but yeah. we need to be skeptical consumers reading the medical literature yeah. and remember that. Um, yeah. And and I'd also, again, I don't like to be on either ends of the extreme. Um, just because something was financially um, supported or there was um, industry sponsorship, that does not make the results wrong. It does not, it, it, it's sort of like saying that's an anecdote, that doesn't count. Well, that was a sponsored study, that doesn't count. Actually, yeah. that was an anecdote, that's interesting, hypothesis generating, let me look at it. That was an industry sponsored study. Interesting. Let me critically appraise it for its validity. And I'll probably be more skeptical because I know of the underlying biases. That's it. Yeah. I have to add my biases, though, that I can't. The problem is I can only critically appraise it so much. If, if I don't <laughs> That's know why what you need nerds like is. me around. <laughs> That's why it, if open access were the case, and if we had some kind of system where, um, where we had people like, Almost like the you have the the quality standards. I don't know. It used to be called JCO here in the United States, called something yeah, else now. But you know, they just show up in, in the ER and make sure things are the way they should be. If there was some kind of process like that to make sure with clinical trials that all the data is being shown, that we're looking at not just the the industry is sponsoring it, but then the the contract research organization or whatever that might be actually conducting the trial and going into those. And if we can see that transparency, then I think absolutely that's. There's, we're on even footing. The problem is right now, we're not on even footing. Um, but I agree with you. Open access reporting. I love your idea of of stating it beforehand and saying we'll publish it. I could see editors shaking in their boots, though. I don't know you're an editor. You tell me like if you have I'm to a say senior yes editor of a journal, I welcome that. But I'm not speaking for my journal. Right, I'm okay. here as Ken Milne. Okay, got it, got it. Well, Ken, it's 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 been a wide ranging uh, conversation. There's so many other things to discuss. Um, I'll leave it on this note. Our our show is called Healing is Possible. Um, healing is not a word we often hear in healthcare. Um, it could be many reasons, but some people say, "Well, we don't really know what that means." Healing could mean so much, but actually, that's true for health too. Even the word health, like what exactly is it? You know, how do we define it? How do we measure it? We, we don't really do that really. So even though we're very comfortable with that word, it's called healthcare after all, it's called a health system after all. Um, so just, I'd love to hear your take as a, as a person who's very rigorous about the evidence, um, your take on how healing and health and healthcare, how are these related? What does that mean to you? Wow, big open philosophical question there at the end. Um, I guess it depends on definitions. So uh, how we define the word healing, and I guess I will define healing as that I did something that the patient appreciated and they felt was important and they valued. And so I go into every shift thinking every patient I see is an opportunity. It's an N of one to help that one person. And I think every single patient interaction is an N of one that I can help someone and I can help them heal. And, you know, healing, again, depends on your definition. That might mean they die, but mm. it could be a good death, mm. right? That might mean they recover. Super. That might mean they maintain that chronic disease. And I'm an emergency physician and I'm seeing them for a chronic disease. But you know what? I can empathize. I can sympathize. I can sit amongst the rubble with them. And sometimes that's enough for them to say thank you. I know I'm in the same position I was when I came in the emergency department as when I'm leaning, but at least I had someone who cared, that listened, and that they were heard. And maybe that is also part of healing. The stories shared here are the experiences of the speakers. They're not intended as medical advice. Join our network or simply share your story at healthrevolution.org. Healing is possible.